As individuals, we are telling our stories. But here in Australia, we have other people resisting. Oh, they've gone to Mykonos and they've gone to major clubs in Mykonos and they're playing Greek music. You lived in a certain suburb, you had more in common than you did with your own people somewhere else. But there is something about the Greek culture that has influenced migration from 3,000 years ago. And in those intimate talks, they would raise existential questions. Did we make the right decision? Was there meaning in our lives? Welcome back to Think Greek. I'm Kyriakos Gold, and we're exploring Greek migration to Australia. Let's go to our guests. Any remarks on the latest wave and how that affected community? I find many things with the latest wave. They are a different uh, sub-community than, for example, my peers. We grew up with traditional values, with still this village focus. The people that have come now, who are our age, have a lot in common because they've been brought up in an urban environment. They are cosmopolitan. They generally speak English, but we preserve these values and these customs and even these cultural memories of the village that they do not. And I find that different evolution uh, fascinating. The other thing I find uh, is if we compare my parents' generation of migrants and grandparents' generation of migrants, the emphasis, apart from getting a job and doing well, was on preserving the language and the culture. That was important to them. That's the reason why we went to Greek school. That's the reason why many people my generation were told off for speaking English. For those people, I find, there's a great emphasis on integration and doing well within the broader Australian society, which I find markedly different from the approach of the previous generation of migrants. There's this idea that, you know, we're here now, we left there, we just want our kids to do well here where we are which I also find with Indian Chinese communities as well. So there's a different attitude towards Australia and the way they see Australia. I see my parents' generation and even many people in my generation, I'm probably one of them guilty as charged, we still haven't come to terms with being here. That's why, that's why there's this, you know, the debate about whether we can vote in Greece and we all want our citizenship rights in Greece. And it's more than just creating a bond with the country that our ancestors have left, it's having a foot in either country yeah. and hedging it both ways and being part of both worlds. So with media, we can do that. You can be part of both worlds and we want to be able to preserve that. Yeah. And I think that idea is a really interesting phenomenon of the modern migration experience, being in two places at once. I want to go to Kostas Marku and Sotiris Hadzmanolis to talk about the latest wave of migration. What happened after the global financial crisis? It was mayhem. It was chaos. In the sense I, might, I, I would say that I was there from the day, from the commencement date, and people started ringing the office of the Greek Orthodox Community in North Victoria. Uh, we tried to establish a database. So all of a sudden, we were asked to become familiar with contemporary migration issues and legislation. We had no idea about that. You know, prior to 2009, 2010, 2011, there was practically zero migration to Australia from 1980 to 2010. Very few people came. And those people that came, they knew exactly what the, the reasons for coming to Australia and immigrating to Australia. After that, all of a sudden there were questions. There was like you know, um, people querying whether they can uh, come to Australia on what basis, uh, what professions, uh, a lot of people that uh, wanted to become students in, you know, uh, in order to create a pathway so they can become permanent residents. That migration, that era of migration from 2010 onwards is characterised by its fluidity. It's characterised by its fluidity because many of these people came and many of these people returned within a short period of time. Yes, it did have pre previously happen, but here it's much more easier. You know, people can get on a plane and depart. People can get on a plane and come to Australia. That did not happen in the 50s. It wasn't possible to happen in the 50s or 60s. Here there was accessibility, you know, airfare tickets were much a little bit more cheaper in comp comparatively speaking. People became disappointed quite easily and got up and left. But there was a large proportion of people that did endeavour to come to Australia and did come to Australia eventually. 
Now, let me preempt that, that the majority of those, I'd say a high percentage of those people were people that had some connectivity, to, connectivity with Australia. Why? Is that their parents might have been born in Australia, so they automatically had citizenship by descent, uh, they had relatives in Australia, uh, or they actually had an active interest with friends and other people that you know, lived in Australia. So communication was quite easy, uh, the exchange of information was quite easy, uh, even though it was distorted from the Greek end sometimes, and from Greek media. So all of a sudden you have these you know, 500 taxi drivers interested to come to Australia. Well, it doesn't happen like that. It was much more complex. Legislation is much more complex today. Κάθε περίπτωση είναι ξεχωριστή. Όλοι μας, σχεδόν όλοι μας, ήρθαμε εδώ πέρα ε, αρχικά με το να μείνουμε δύο, τρία ή τέσσερα χρόνια και να επιστρέψουμε. Κάποιοι εκεί στη δεκαετία του 80 που η Ελλάδα ε, ζούσε έτσι μια εντυπωσιακή ανάπτυξη και από άποψη οικονομίας αλλά και ελευθεριών άλλαξε η χώρα με την είσοδό της ε, στην Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση και με την πολιτική αλλαγή που είχε γίνει τότε με το ΠΑΣΟΚ. Κάποιοι λοιπόν τόλμησαν να υλοποιήσουν το όνειρο της ε, παλινόστησης και επέστρεψαν. Άλλοι πέρασαν και περνάνε καλά, άλλοι ζωρίστηκαν λίγο, αλλά όταν ήρθε η κρίση, κάποιοι από αυτούς δεν μπορούσαν να βγάλουν πέρα. Και οι μεν μεγάλοι παρέμειναν, οι περισσότεροι, πολλά όμως από τα παιδιά τους που είχαν τη διέξοδο, μπορούσαν να έρθουν σε Αυστραλία, επέλεξαν να γυρίσουν πίσω για να μπορέσουν να επιβιώσουν. Και μιλάμε για, τουλάχιστον από αυτού που έχω γνωρίσει εγώ, Πολλοί αξιόλογους ανθρώπους ήταν όλοι μορφωμένοι, πτυχιούχοι, ε, μιλάνε καλύτερα αγγλικά από μας εδώ πέρα, ε, είχαν όλα τα προσόντα. Ε, μερικοί ξαναγύρισαν πάλι στην Ελλάδα όταν πέρασε το πρώτο σοκ της κρίσης. Άλλοι έχουν μείνει εδώ και νομίζω ότι η παρουσία, η παρουσία τους, όσο και αν είναι κάτι τραγικό, αιμορραγία για την Ελλάδα, είναι ευλογία και για την Αυστραλία, γιατί τις προσφέρουν πολλά με τις γνώσεις, και για την παρικία γιατί την έχουν αναζωογονήσει με τις πνευματικές τους και τις άλλες ε, ανησυχίες. Έφεραν ένα φρέσκο αέρα και αυτό είναι πολύ ευχάριστο. When people finally in their journey here anchor themselves to this country, they do it in two ways. They do it through their grandchildren and ultimately their place of burial. And that's where I believe the final belonging, anchoring is. And most people are oblivious to that. Of course, you, are. you don't go around thinking about that, but it strikes you when you view it, that your grandchildren define and anchor you, and then the place of burial finishes that. I want to be a Greek citizen, and I want to be an Australian citizen. I love this country. I think it's the greatest country in the world. I it's greater than Greece? Uh, it's the greatest country in the world, and I think the fact is that our generation, all here, and George is a philosopher. Now, let's be honest, if his family stayed in Greece in the village, and he's a genius in that village. Let's say he's the genius. Best student, can Aristuchos. I guarantee you, come to go to, if he qualified to go to university in Athens, someone with a bigger meson would have had cut him out and he would have ended up being a goat herder or a, or a laborer or a, in, the, in the merchant navy in the 50s and the 60s of Greece. Because that's the reality. Our parents, we're not talking about Greece of the late 80s or the 90s, we're talking about Greece of the 50s, 60s, 70s. And let's be honest, there was no opportunity. You need symbolic changes. That is, you need practical changes, but also symbols. The 15-storey cultural centre was conceived as part of our own vision to ensure that we were creating something that was contemporary and something that was relevant so that the generations that follow us have a reference point that they can relate to. And this 15-storey cultural centre houses a number of other organisations such as NUGAS, the Hellenic Initiative, as well as other community groups. Equally, through the 15 floors, we've devoted five to six floors for community purposes, largely free of cost, which is a function centre, a library, meeting rooms, two levels of schools, as well as hosting Greek banks, uh, Greek lawyers, other Greek schools like Ethere, etc. So we've created the vertical precinct acknowledging that our city is developing particularly during COVID times and that we need to be where the services are required. We're expanding as a result of additional funding and this relates to the work we have with government to four other areas with uh, funding of close to two million dollars in Brunswick, 
Northcote, Paran and Footscray, where we will be augmenting our community halls to provide additional infrastructure from an educational and cultural perspective in those areas throughout Melbourne, and equally, because our historical centre is important, that is in Lonsdale Street, we, through government support, uh, developed a new community hub on Russell Street, um, which is expanding the footprint of the community and further announcements will be made to ensure that what has historically been the centre of Hellenism here in Melbourne continues to have a say in a voice. In Greece, at any given time, I was told by the ambassador in the early 2000s, there would be 100,000 people in Greece that hold a, or are entitled to hold an Australian passport. That is the second biggest, the second largest cohort of, Greek, uh, of Australians living outside Australia. The first is the UK and then was Greece. And just give, let, let me give you a, a comparison. Uh, 100,000 Australians living, or Greek Australians living in Greece, 40,000 Italians. There's a disparity there. I really love being part of the Greek diaspora. I think it's a very dynamic and wonderful thing and I've seen through my research again how we've developed from a minority sensibility to a community sensibility and now a, dias a, a diaspora sensibility. I love being able to communicate with people like like-minded people in England, in America, in Japan. In, it, it opens a world of possibility and why I love it particularly is because my daughter finds that very exciting. Um, she finds that very dynamic and, and very interesting and something that she actually likes to be a part of, mm. you know, even though she's a third generation mm. Greek Australian. In the last four or five years, a lot of people from my family and my immediate surroundings have died. Mm -hmm. Relatives and friends, first generation Greeks. These people, in my opinion, were giants on a personal level, struggling for a better life for themselves, for their families in Greece, for the children. But at the same time, they were political giants, people with no particular uh, advantages. They were able to create a voice for themselves and challenge things. That's, that's where I come from. But one of the saddest things I have experienced is associating myself with these people in family gatherings. I would listen to them talk to each other because for them migration was always a, a shared thing, a shared experience. Everything was shared. And this is the big difference between the first and the second generation of Greek migrants. Okay? Even death is something they share. Okay? So I would listen to them as almost I would be outside the circle, so to speak. I would listen to them talk to each other in a language they, they fully understood amongst themselves. And in those intimate talks, they would raise existential questions. Did we make the right decision? Okay? Was there meaning in our lives? Uh, and that is one of the saddest things I have experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps it is part of the migrant being in limbo. Perhaps mm -hmm. it is part of the human condition. <laughs> to mm -hmm. make it deeper, I'm not quite sure what it is. But migration, or the psychology and the ontology of the migrant, perhaps is still a mystery. Still a mystery, mm -hmm. you know, the identity mm -hmm. of the migrant. We Greeks are renowned for prizing ourselves for everything and being special and, and all the rest of it. But there is something about the Greek culture that has influenced migration from 3,000 years ago. I mean, we know that we'd love to go and explore new lands. It wasn't economy necessarily. It wasn't because we were persecuted or suffered or whatever. It was that spirit of exploring new lands. So that migration uh, has remained, in my view, as a part of our cultural heritage. And this is why I think Greeks, like many other migrants, find it a little bit challenging and sometimes uh, not uh, something that they can um, accept easily. Nevertheless, it's part 
of our spirit, part of our culture. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're, we're a migrant culture. The world around us is rapidly evolving. Uh, we are competing as a community group against so many other diverse interests that are available through so many other different platforms. So to attract the attention of those that we feel um, we deserve their attention and to not only attract their attention but to get them to participate, we need to be efficient and effective in terms of our product development and our engagement. And I think that is the future of the community, but equally, it's challenge. Uh, I think we're well placed to do that. We've developed the infrastructure necessary to make sure we've got the platforms, whether they're multimedia platforms, whether they're educational or cultural programs. I think we will see an evolving community, which has happened during my time. Yeah. I am the first non-Greek born president of the community in 125 years. Boards that have worked with me are the first fully second generation boards in the history of the Greek community, that is people born outside of Greece. This is happening. I think what we provided was a comical character soundtrack. But I think, you know, the Greeks being as impassioned as what they are, and I think our parents coming out here as migrants and with one clear objective, and that was to provide a future that was full of possibility and promise for their children, has paid off brilliantly. I mean, Greeks are at the top of every field, whether it's medicine or law or the creative space or business or property development, finance. You know, Greeks are doing great business in every portion of you know the Australian industries, um, which is really satisfying, certainly for the parents who sacrifice so much to give those children that opportunity, that's paid off. Is it a sign of maturity of uh, a community when it's producing children's books? We are producing children's books. And the interesting thing about the children's books that we are producing is from what I see, the vast majority of authors are mothers so it's a woman's voice and most of them have to do with the rituals of being a greek australian so there are books especially the Ikogenia series which has come out in adelaide by a particular author she's a young mother and she writes about what it is to go and see your grandparents in australia but they happen to be greek what things your grandmother will do for you what would your grandfather do for you then there's panayota andriadakis who's written books about the abc of greek easter and the ABC of uh, Greek Christmas. So it's almost like she's teaching the culture. So for me, I can't believe that it's taken this long to get here, except that I happen to remember that in the 80s, because my mum was involved in this process, and so were people like Varvara Ioannou, we were already doing this. And you were using the City Kids books, there was funding from governments back when multicultural funding wasn't about fixing your community organization's toilet, but actually to produce culture, yeah? Now they just give you money and they say, fix your toilet. Most of those toilets are already fixed. It's a big scam. You can put that in there. Uh, back then they were writing books. Famous illustrators like Lee Hobbs, who's an acclaimed Australian children's illustrator, were illustrating books for the Greek community. Kipros Kiprianou, Nina Guest, all these people. So again, going back to amnesia, we've forgotten that we've been here before. So is it a sign of maturity that we've forgotten that we were producing these books in the 80s and now we're trying to do it again? I don't know. Maybe it's a sign of our amnesia and our illegitimacy and the fact that there isn't a coherent thread of a Greek-Australian identity running through our history. The only difference is this. In the, back then, they were writing books in Greek to teach Greek to Greek-Australian kids. Now these books are written in English because there is an assumption that the third generation does not speak Greek. But potentially, it is because the decline in terms of numbers of the community was stopped because of the latest migration wave, and that rejuvenated the community. I mean, we I see it in the event. I wouldn't see that through the children's books, because yeah. these children's books are not directed towards the kids that are coming now, or recent arrivals from Greece. They're directed to third, fourth generation people that have settled here. They're teaching the culture from the beginning. Tell me about English. your book. Yeah, my book's written in Greek and in English, uh, and it's a book which has nothing to do with Greek Australia. 
It's a fairy tale about the genocide, Pondian genocide. It's called Sumela and the Magic Emenje. And it's about a girl who, through metaphysical and supernatural uh, uh, means, through the music of a pro the protective cocoon of the music of the Kemenje, which is a Pondian instrument, uh, is brought to safety. And that's a book about how you can teach kids in a safe way about the bad things that happen in the world, uh, how you can teach social justice and why it's important, the fact that kids need to be protected from harm in a way that doesn't inc inculcate hatred against a supposed enemy. And it's also my family story because my grandfather lived through the Asia Minor catastrophe. He escaped on foot 11 years old from Aden to uh, Zmirny on his own. So that's part of my story. And I had to live with this wonderful old man screaming every night and having nightmares growing up every time he went to bed. How do you put trauma in a book? Well, that's Kids. the point. That, that was a challenge for me. How do you do it? But I mean, fairy tales about trauma. I mean, look at Little Red Riding Hood, <laughs> yeah. you know? She ate her, the wolf ate grandmother, you know, and then ate her up in some of the versions. And then the huntsman had to get an ax and cut open the stomach and liberate them. That's pretty graphic, but that's what fairy tales do. They allow you to, to discuss the bad things about life in a safe way. And we have an enormous amount of fairy tales in the Greek tradition, which we haven't passed on to our kids. We Disneyfy our traditions and pass that on. So this was my idea of saying, well, how can I combine these elements and also my lived experience as a Greek Australian growing up next to one of the Pondian community buildings and becoming fascinated with that culture as I found it here and weaving that into a story. Indigenous genocides are also part of your story. Yes, they are. And it's uh, and in the in the book, I actually mentioned the fact in the resources that you can you, you can bring the two together. together. Yeah. You bring them together. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. that's, that's fascinating. Because it, it is. I mean, my understand one of the things that I always felt is as a Greek community, we're best placed to understand the trauma of the indigenous population because we went through almost exactly the same thing. The journey never ends. Stay with us for more Think Greek next week. I understand how you feel because when I went back to my country I was also treated as a stranger. Even for these supposedly progressive people who are at the forefront in the Greek community, being gay is considered a moral character failing.